Hey, this is Zach. Hey, Zach. How are you? It's Mike and Jay. Hey, Zach. All right. You guys ready to roll? Yeah, for sure. We wanted some clarification on the name first, though. Zach O'Malley Greenberg. Believe it or not. Yeah, is that so? Are you an Irish Jew? Is that what it is? I, sh- I sure am. Is that, <laughs> yeah. Is that common or rare? It seems it seems like it'd be um, rare. It's more common than you would think. Actually, yeah. Dublin had a Jewish mayor at one point, okay. um, and I encounter you know, but usually it's like somebody one of you know, it's a. Uh, a, a Jewish person and a Irish person getting married, and then like their gotcha. kids are kind of. Aren't you using the? the aren't you using Z O G to your benefit though? Somehow, isn't that, Don't you call it your Zog or something? Your daily musings. I should maybe. I don't no, know. I thought I, I saw. Uh, I, th- I thought I oh, saw Z- something. Zog like blog. That. Yeah, Zog blog. Yeah, Zog blog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you Very go. Good. Well, yeah. that's not why we wanted to talk to you, Zach. Believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've had, really enjoyed your book, man. Three Kings, Diddy, Dr. Dre, Jay Z, and Hip Hop's multi-billion-dollar rise. I hope it's doing well for you. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so far, so good. Well, you seem like the perfect guy to do this. Is uh, your your position in life, senior editor of media and entertainment at Forbes. That sounds like a very interesting gig. Um, what what does that entail exactly? Yeah, well, um, basically, you know, uh, I run all of our earnings lists and our wealth lists for entertainers. So that involves, you know, uh, the Celebrity 100, which is our accounting of the 100 highest paid entertainers every year. Uh, then I do our breakdown specifically in the music area. So I'll do the hip hop list i'll do the country list the edm list and so on and uh you know really try to give everybody a picture of who's making who's banking the most every year that is a challenge i mean we yeah. often refer to lists that list that very yeah. list how accurate is it yeah I mean. <laughs> I, it's as accurate as it gets i mean I, you know it's uh <laughs> it's you know we put a lot of time and energy into those numbers so you know, a lot of people see, uh, you know, there are other numbers floating around the internet, but you get the feeling that it's just, you know, some guy in his basement. Um, we're, you know, we're out there, we're calling sources, we're going through public data, you know, we're going through, uh, filings and, you know, we have private databases that we get into where we can track the average gross of a musician, for example, or the total album equivalent, uh, streams and album sales combined for musical artists, we look at, you know, uh, box office for actors. We look at side business mm-hmm. ventures. We're, we're actually out there, you know, calling people who are experts in the specific fields that people have private companies. So, you know, if, if Diddy has a tequila brand, which I mean, he does, um, you know, we're out there calling up the beverage analysts and trying to put a value on, on that company. And then, you know, and, and, you know, and, and kind of applying it to, to, uh, to his numbers. So, yeah. So is that like a strong finance background or entertainment or both? Is it like I'm a finance nerd, but I'm handling the entertainment wing of this this venture? Well, you know, it's really a lot of learning on the job because there's not really any other sort of comparable uh, thing to, to train for. So, I mean, you can be an econ major in college and, and understand, you know, macro, micro econ, but that doesn't really tell you, you know, for example, what percentage of gross a a musician would take home from a concert or, you know, how it would differ from country to EDM to a big pop show. So that's, you know, that's kind of on the job training, institutional knowledge and stuff that we just have to kind of pass down from one person to the next who has this job at Forbes. Well, this is a fascinating way of looking at these guys because we read a lot of books by entertainers or about entertainers and you get the behind the scenes stories about concerts and tours and so forth. To me, to hear what the nuts and bolts are behind various deals is just so fascinating. So this is a different kind of book, I think, mm-hmm. than we've ever had. Yeah. Um, it, but it hits the history of hip hop and how these three kings turned it into to one of the world's most influential and lucrative cultural movements, really a cultural phenomenon. How long had you been working on this? Um, the, the book itself, uh, I spent pretty much the last two years on, but, you know, overall, and I'd say my entire professional career has been leading up to this. So, you know, uh, a decade at Forbes covering this business, it's been a decade since I started doing the, uh, the hip hop earnings package back in 2007. So, you know, all of that, yeah, you know, all those uh, investigations and interviews and all that kind of informs the 
the reporting of the book. Yeah, I mean, you you did a ton of research on this mm-hmm. thing. It, you, I don't know, maybe what an eighth of the book presently is devoted to uh, footnotes and and notes and so <laughs> forth, and explaining where you got all these sources. So a lot of work went into this, and uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. But um, I'm wondering with Diddy especially. I remember you guys came out with your Forbes list. I don't know, two years ago maybe. Mm-hmm. And 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 I was absolutely gobsmacked to see him <laughs> topping the list with like 800 million. I was, it seemed like I hadn't really heard or seen from Diddy publicly all that much. Not that I wasn't paying that much attention, but it wasn't like he was top of mind on the charts or in movies or TV. And here it is like he's earned more than anybody. Yeah, no, I mean, both in terms of earnings and until recently in terms of total wealth, um, you know, Diddy is usually number one. So Jay-Z just overtook uh, Jay-Z in terms of net worth this year. So, you know, there's there's two different things we look at in Forbes. There's the earnings and there's the net worth. The earnings are on an annual basis, so that could be spiked by um, a big sale of something or a big tour. Uh, and then the net worth is where we go and we, we add up all of the sort of career earnings. We take out for spending and taxes and so forth. And then we add up all the, the value of, of the assets on paper. So, um, you know, with Diddy, uh, there's his arrangement with Ciroc is a huge chunk of that. Um, Delion Tequila, as I mentioned, uh, Revolt TV, these are all things that you can put a number on. And although, you know, it may not be the same as the Puff Daddy and the family days, He's certainly when you add it all up, it's just it's quite an empire and it's remarkable um, that he built off of the music. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you think about it. He hasn't been musically relevant for f- probably 15 years. Is that fair? But here he is. He's, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. But here he is. He's, he's grown into Dominant. this business mogul. No. Even if you think about Dr. Dre, you know, I mean, he's he's only put out three uh, solo studio albums during his entire career. So, you know, he, he just also happened to have one. Um, really, really big hit with uh, Beats, so that kind of yeah. makes up for a lot of lost time. Yeah, but he, but he had success with Snoop and and Warren G in the early, in those days, and then Eminem exploded. I mean, he right, he, he had 50 his Cent, Kendrick had 50, Lamar. Yep. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, I found Diddy to be the most fascinating part of the book, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I wonder if you know, maybe you don't know, but <laughs> but where a guy like that gets such an amazing set of confidence like it's he's he's a kid he's 23 years old or something and he's going to this company and he's like i remember being 23 in a job and it was like yes sir no sir whatever you say boss sign here and and he's in there just like yeah i'm gonna need a a, a ton of money and when you think you've hit that (laughs) when you think you've hit that money amount you haven't and then when you think you've hit the money amount again we're going to need some whipped cream and cherry on top. And it's like, yeah, where yeah. Is this that's one of my favorite quotes in the book. It's awesome. Yeah. So, you know, with, with the book, I think one of the main things is I tried to present uh, a blueprint uh, for how each of it. So the book is, is three things, right? It's, it's a history of hip hop. It's a biography of each of the three guys. And it's this blueprint. It's a blueprint of how, of how three different entrepreneurs, you know, very different, despite the fact that they all have the job description, hip hop mogul, uh, managed to get to this sort of near billionaire territory. And, you know, Diddy is, is one path, right? Diddy is the charisma junkie. He's the consummate salesman. He's in your face all the time. He's got that bravado. Um, Dre, on the other end of the spectrum, is actually very quiet, very reserved, introverted, and Jay-Z somewhere in the middle. But, um, you know, the idea was to, to kind of show these examples and maybe if, if you as a, as a, entrepreneur as a, as a professional have some of those qualities you could kind of like follow that path so for diddy you know you you kind of can't teach that kind of charisma i think um yeah. but uh you know there are people who are just magnetic and you know if if you have that then then i think it's best to sort of follow that that diddy salesman path and but you know one of the things about diddy is that no matter uh how big he got he still had that attention to detail, um, that focus on the user experience. So, um, one of the things, so, you know, you ask, where did it start? I mean, early, I guess the, the confidence started early, but so did this attention to detail. So, you know, over the years, you know, talking to him for some of my Forbes stories, he always would tell me about how, when he was a, a little kid, he had, he had, uh, Four paper routes because, you know, Diddy, one is not enough. But um, yeah. <laughs> one of the reasons he was able to get so many is that uh, instead of just going and throwing that um, that paper willy-nilly into the yard, 
he would go up and actually to each of his customers, he'd open the screen door and put the paper in between the screen door and the front door. And the idea being that, you know, you you just remove that, that one step, that extra effort. And, you know, customers really respond to that all the way through to today where he'll actually go into bars and clubs and, and, uh, and say, Hey, why is the Ciroc vodka on the bottom shelf? It should be on the top shelf. It's, it's and funny. It, yeah. It's, yeah. it's funny you say that because I, I met Diddy once and I was working at a, a rock radio station and uh-huh. whatever year it was, he came out with the, uh, the single, the tribute to, to notorious B I G and he had the, mm-hmm. the police song, every breath you take. Um, and, he came in, you know, it was after I did the morning show. It was after the morning show, but me and another producer producer were still there. And all of a sudden, Diddy walks into our office, like no guards with him, no nobody. He's just in a T-shirt. He's got his big diamond encrusted uh, cross on. And he's like, hey, man, uh, do you guys have a few minutes? And I'm like, uh, Puff Daddy just walked into my office. Sure, man, come on in. And it's like he didn't send a rep, an A&R rep. He didn't send... <laughs> He didn't send, you know, just send, mail a case of them to the station like most people. He physically, personally came in and thought, well, hmm. it's got crossover appeal because it's got the police as a backtrack. And so he just stopped by with it in hand. He's like, <laughs> would you guys mind listening to this and tell me what you think? And so we hung, <laughs> hung with him for 20 minutes. He couldn't have been nicer. And, and it was like, I've never seen any artist do that ever, yeah. S- especially at his level. I mean, he was a giant then. Oh yeah, for sure. And you know, another thing about Diddy is he just doesn't sleep. Uh, that's one of the things in interviewing people, uh, who, who spend time with him or work with him, you know, uh, he, he's up until, you know, he's out at the club getting paid for appearances, maybe getting on the microphone. Uh, but you know, but he's doing market research, right. About Sarah, yeah. about music, about yeah. whatever it is. He stays out until, till, you know, four in the morning and then he gets up at, at eight or nine and he, you know, whatever he, works out he goes to his meetings uh you know he's constantly flying around the country he has his whole work set up on his jet you know it's it's uh it's a a non-stop operation and if you think about man you know i need i need probably seven hours of sleep to function like a human being uh and and diddy can work on half of that the the amount of time that you uh that you accrue that you can apply to to other ventures just kind of adds up hey one of the things you mentioned zach is that you go through the history of hip-hop which i think is really helpful to this because what you're doing as you said is you're, you're building a blueprint for each of these guys success and one of the influential characters that you see come coming up time and time again is russell simmons Mm-hmm. Um, with Def Jam and and Fat Farm, his involvement in those, is it sure. possible to overstate the importance that Russell Simmons played in so far as he created an early business mogul model for these guys? Yeah, you know Russell Simmons is a really complicated figure. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, especially y- y- you can't talk about Russell Simmons now without talking about uh, the the allegations of rape. Um, that have you know been levied against him you know uh it's which which he denies but i mean i love how you you had to preface that every time you brought him up too like hey by the way paren right paren yeah and they and you do and there's now i mean there's a giant um asterisk in 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 front of him now um so you you can't really mention russell simmons without mentioning that but you also can't really mention the history of the business of hip-hop without mentioning russell simmons and like you say uh, he, you know, he, he was really the first to provide the business blueprint with Def Jam, you know, creating his own label, creating his own, um, uh, clothing line and fat farm and, you know, and just sort of, uh, a lot of the, um, the, the ideas, you know, that Jay-Z, Diddy and Dr. Dre had, I mean, he, he laid that blueprint for them, but the, the thing that, and in fact, directly mentored uh, Jay Z, uh, especially. Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, you know, but um, the thing that that he couldn't do that they can do. I mean, Russell Simmons is a celebrity, but you know, he he's never as big as as these three guys are now. And you know, he doesn't have the platform uh, of music to be putting out where he can, for example rap about products that he owns or has a financial interest in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for Jay-Z in particular, that that's been a a, a real driving force. It's Jay-Z's the most prolific of three, Um, you know, really early on in his career, right after his first album, 
he was wearing a lot of iceberg, uh, which is a, a European sportswear designer. And so mm-hmm. he, he went and tried to get some kind of endorsement deal and they barely even wanted to give him free clothes. So that was the genesis of, of him starting his own clothing line, uh, in the, in the mid nineties, rock aware. And, you know, that was a case of, uh, he was on Def Jam and so he went to Russell Simmons and, you know, went for advice and, and that was kind of part of the way he was able to build up mm-hmm. his, uh, his brand. But, you know, suddenly, you know, whenever he was going to rap about iceberg, he would rap about rock and, right. and I think that's been a philosophy of his, you know, why rap about some brand, somebody else's brand enriching them when I could have my own and just be giving myself free advertising. Yeah. These guys masterfully figured out that if we're going to be players on the scene, why not pick up multiple revenue streams? Yeah. You know, everything yeah. from fashion to, uh, the alcohol, uh, brands that they have to live Na- Jay Z's involvement in live, live nation. And now their present involvement in the streaming aspects mm-hmm. of things. I mean, it's just yeah. absolutely genius. Well, it's funny too, Jay, because we have often talked about like, what does a rapper do when he gets older? Like, if mm-hmm. you you like it's one thing for Paul McCartney to go up on stage and and sing Penny Lane with a with an audience, but you know when you look at rap lyrics, Jay Z at seventy can't be going. I got ninety nine problems and a bitch ain't one. Just doesn't right. doesn't feel like it would work. So <laughs> well, you know, but then again, you have uh, seventy and eighty year old rockers up there now. You know, talking about you know sex and drugs, and uh, you know you you kind of maybe get the impression that they're, that they're not doing either of those things as much as they were in their 20s. <laughs> that, you that's know? true, like, but isn't isn't hip-hop different? I mean, it, we've we've talked about this on the, our show a lot with Eminem with respect mm-hmm. to what, you know, and he's, he's said openly, he's questioned many times, and particularly his latest record, about whether he can still stay relevant. And, yeah, you know, as Mike yeah. just alluded to, I mean, we were really wondering, like, this is kind of new territory. Mm-hmm. He's blazing the trail of an older hip-hop artist and whether this is just a young man's <laughs> game or whether he can continue this into his 50s, 60s, 70s, like the McCartneys, et cetera. Yeah, well, you know, it is and it isn't, right? I think uh, if you look at somebody like Paul McCartney, he's tremendously successful on the road, um, but his albums don't sell obviously anywhere near what they did, uh, sure. you know, the Beatles, I mean, come on. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, even a band like U2, their their albums do not have the same impact that, that they did um, many years ago in terms of sales. But... They can still go out on the road, uh, Paul McCartney, U2, and you know, and and attract probably a larger crowd than just about anybody else in the world. So, you know, I, I think you don't really need to be putting out new music if you have such an extensive catalog. Um, and you know, at some point, I think with a lot of classic rockers, it starts to be like, hey, just play the hits. We don't want to hear your your, sure. your your new stuff that we have no connection to. I think Jay Z totally understands that. I mean, the first thing he said when he signed his Live Nation deal was, "I've become the Rolling Stones of hip hop," and you know, the Rolling Stones. I think I think really perhaps more than any of the legacy acts understand that they don't need to be putting out new music. I mean, that that people don't really care that much and they just want to hear the hits. So you know, but when you have that many hits, it's fine. So I think the model is really more, you know. Uh, develop that catalog of hits and then and then keep touring it um you yeah, know or yeah, marry we'll, beyonce we'll, and just go out on tour with her whole yeah life. that's true i i think i, I will agree to disagree on this i think it's it's, fun, it's a hook. fundamentally different experience a, yeah, a hip-hop yeah, yeah. show and a rock show i think the true. lack of melody melody, melody really plays a part it, that worms your way into your brain and you think oh penny lane penny lane no, 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 no. you know yeah. where is this just not there like it works lose yourself you could do eminem could do lose yourself at 70 that will always work in a <laughs> right. stadium but i don't know that i don't know that criminal or bitch will moreover you know? there's an right. attitude to it there's a prowl you know that yeah, just yeah, isn't yeah, there yeah. when you're 70 but whatever um, spinning back to russell simmons the first seven figure commercial deal in hip hop was run dmc and adidas was he was Correct. he was he part of that deal too well, that's right. Yeah, he. So, so this is really a, kind of a monumental moment in the in the history of the business of hip hop. So, in the mid '80s, uh, Run DMC had this song, "My Adidas." Mm-hmm. It was this uncompensated sort of innocent ode to shell-toed sneakers. And um, but Russell Simmons knew the, the potential that it had. He was managing them at the time, and so he invited executives from Germany, from Adidas, to come to the show at, at Madison Square Garden. And when the time came for the group to play my Adidas, they told the audience, take off your Adidas and wave them in the air. 
and which they did and then and then they played my adidas Genius. and and meanwhile Genius. these executives are sitting up there you know <laughs> seeing fifteen thousand people taking off their adidas i mean it's the best product placement of all time right i mean how yeah. can you how can you top that it's uh, unreal. and so they they signed uh run dmc to this million dollar sneaker deal that uh you know that, that russell simmons was uh kind of orchestrating so that really opened the door down the line for acts like jay-z um and uh i mean mainly you know mainly jay-z was the one with the sneaker jay-z and 50 cent were sort of the, the big sneaker guys mm-hmm. um ironically dr dre wanted to do a sneaker and he told the interscope records chief jimmy iovine this and jimmy said Forget sneakers, let's sell speakers. Yeah. And that was how Beats was born. But we can yeah, get into that. Before in a we dig into detail on that, because that is incredibly fascinating, that whole deal. I, I, I want to, if you could, just hit one more really prominent um, rap iconic figure. And covering the sure. history of hip hop, you, you obviously cover the East Coast, West Coast feud of the 90s. And rightfully so, you document Suge Knight and his bullying and intimidation, et cetera. Was Suge's presence at death row and his status as a central player in the rap business in any way helpful to how the Three Kings developed? Or was Suge and his antics just a completely tragic distraction to their progress? Um, I think overall, you know, Suge Knight was a was a negative for hip hop and, you know, was a distraction. And, and I think he really he derailed a lot of the. Um, sort of the movement toward mainstream commercial appeal that hip hop had uh, in terms of being involved with brands. Although, you know, I think the the violence and the controversy increased mainstream interest in the music. It was sort of, uh, you know, it, it, not all all of the publicity was positive. Uh, I do think it it, it, did, yeah, it delayed it, it delayed hip hop's um, arrival in the in the mainstream you know sort of brand space, but. Um, you know, I mean, specifically with with Dr. Dre, you know, Suge Knight was was useful for a time. I mean, he helped get him out of his previous uh, record deal. Mm-hmm. You know, um, he certainly, you know, helped create this death row ethos that, you know, built up a certain subgenre of hip hop. And, you know, he really uh, he championed uh, Tupac Shakur Um at a time when a lot of people were kind of down on him. And, you know, I think Tupac came to see him as a protector during a, a period where he, he felt like the world was kind of out to get him. Yeah. And well, well, reading your book, Zach, this, uh, yeah. sorry, this, this is the first time I got the same feeling as Jay. Like, was this guy worth anything to these guys? Cause we, we know the stories of, you know, you've heard the vanilla ice thing and, and yeah. you know, them the, over the balcony. Yeah. You, you've heard all those things, but it seems like, you know, and I think it was Jerry Heller who said these guys weren't gangsters. These guys were play gangsters. They were artists, you know, um, Puff right. was middle class. Dre was a nerd. Biggie was a mama's boy. Tupac yeah. was a very, very smart scholarly kid poet. poet. And, yeah. and and it seems like every time there was an issue that came up and let's be honest, there were some real tragedies that came up in those oh, East yeah. coast, West coast things. Suge Knight seemed to be at the center of all, all of it always. He, he did. And, you know, I mean, an interesting thing that I found in, in researching the book, though, was some people who didn't even feel that Suge was a was, you know, a really uh, a true gangster. Uh, and that, you know, the thing that the only thing that Suge responded to was other real gangsters kind of put, checking him in line and, you know, people standing up to him. And there are a few instances in the book where you see, you know, you see people standing up to him and, and Suge kind of saying, okay, I respect that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to back off. But I think what Suge realized is exactly that, 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 you know, the hip hop world was kind of full of, um, you know, a lot of people who, who weren't necessarily what they portrayed themselves to be. And, and there was sort of this almost arms race, uh, in terms of image and toughness. And, and a lot of the guys started, you know, kind of, turning into the characters they were portraying. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I think it was, if anything more, it was more Suge kind of like, you know, filling a power vacuum and, and realizing he could get away with throwing his weight around. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, and then, and then a tragedy kind of ensued. But I think as, as these guys developed, you know, kind of, kind of started playing these characters that, you know, play really kind of method acting, um, 
you know, they would start to surround themselves with actual gangsters. And, and I think when that happened, you know, that, that was where a lot of the violence uh, occurred. Well, he did have it. He did serve his purpose, Suge Knight. And, and I, I would, I love the story. It's one of my favorite songs ever is California love and Suge, Mm -hmm. Suge and Jimmy Iovine bail, um, Tupac out of jail. And, and the story that you tell in here, I don't know if you want to tell it now about him flying private, he just flying private out to California to Dre's studio. Yeah, he you know he gets this on this jet um, from New York to California from you know right, right out of jail, and and he basically goes right into the studio and records, and he'd been thinking about all these songs in, in prison and so on, and Dre and Tupac are in the studio, and Tupac immediately spits that verse uh, of California Love. I don't. And then yeah, it, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then and then as soon as it's done, he goes back and they want to double it, you know, to to give that like extra punch. Yeah. And he spits it verbatim in, in the same just case, the same like immediately after that, perfectly, it's, and just kind of Dre, Dre's like, "Holy cow, this is you know." <laughs> it's, that's unbelievable. If you've ever been in a studio and tried to double, do overdubs or something, the fact that with nothing written down. He hears just the basic, just the basic track that Dre's working on for California Love. He's like, "Got it." Jumps in, yeah. nails this, and then yeah. the identical cadence without any. It's that's fucking incredible. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, it, it's the craziest. Uh, thing yeah, ever. I mean, it, yeah, it's it's pretty uh, pretty wild. I mean, Tupac was obviously an, an incredible talent, and yeah, yeah. and you really wonder what he would have grown into. You know, I mean, he, he might, he, you know, he could have been. I don't know. I mean, he could have been uh, yeah. an actor. He could have taken the the Ice Cube path or the Will Smith path. He could have been a. a he could have been a politician. He could have been a leader. I mean, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I think there there would have been a lot of options. But he was, uh, you know, it's it's kind of hard to imagine. I mean, Tupac and Biggie, but they were they were only in their in their twenty four, twenty five when they got killed. So yeah. it, it just uh, we never really got to see, unfortunately, what, what they could what, become. What is your opinion? Do you think do you think uh, Pac was killed because of the the fight he got into with the gang member that night in the hotel? Um, well, you know, I, I lay it out in the book and I, I don't want to, you know, accuse anybody of murder, I guess. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that, that points to, uh, the, the fight that he and Shug got into with some crypts in the casino before, before this Mike Tyson fight. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I mean, there he is in, in that car with, with Shug and, you know, stuck in traffic and somehow Tupac takes all those shots and, and Suge, I think he was maybe grazed or something by a bullet, but yeah, that to me is, uh, I mean, if you're somebody who wants to kill Tupac, why, why don't you also try to kill Suge Knight? That's, you know, and it's not like it would have been hard. So yeah, uh, it's a weird one. It's a weird one. (laughs) That's, that's why I, uh, I continue to wonder. (laughs) Zach, the beats deal. It's the deal. That's probably the centerpiece to this whole book. And it's absolutely fascinating. The, of course, the May, 2014 Apple purchase of beats for 3.2 billion, Mm -hmm. which put Dre into the billionaire status. Um, fascinating deal. Tell us there, there, I guess is some discrepancy on who had the idea was it the monster cable guy, Noel Lee? Was it Iovine and Dre? Tell us how that whole Beats idea came to be. Yeah, so, you know, to, to kind of recap from, from earlier, Jay-Z and Jimmy Iovine are walking down the beach in Malibu, and Dre says to Jimmy, uh, I've got a sneaker deal on the table, and Jimmy says, F sneakers, let's make speakers. Uh, then they go to Noel Lee, they team up with Monster Cable as the manufacturer, uh, and they and they create these very bass heavy headphones uh, that we know today as Beats. And from the get go, though, that they have this philosophy. Um, it's not just about the headphones. It's about it's about the fashion. Uh, and and in fact, I interviewed mm-hmm. the CEO of Best Buy at the time. I also interviewed uh, Noel Lee, the head of Monster. And you know, basically, what they did is they they went to the head of Best Buy and they said, I mean, this is you know, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, the depths of the Great Recession, and they said, when your salespeople are talking, trying to convince the kid with three hundred bucks in his pocket to buy these headphones, you have to say like you're not competing against 
Bose or Sennheiser or other headphones, you're competing against Air Jordan, right? That kid's gonna yeah. either buy these headphones or he's gonna buy the Jordan. Totally. And and you have to you have to set up the decision as such. And and that's exactly what they did. And it's and it's the reason why they were able to not just grow the product but but grow the category. And they actually you know, I think far from from destroying Bose or Sennheiser, they just kind of raised the profile of of, you know, really expensive headphones to where it's not just audiophiles, but it's, you know, people wanting to make a fashion statement or people wanting to say, oh, you know, I'm a music connoisseur of some kind or, you know, I want to pay a lot of uh, money for, for, for my audio experience. Yeah. Whether it's actually better or not is another question, but... It blew up uh, a whole industry. That yeah. industry just didn't exist before yeah, that. It was earbuds. Like you say, yeah, people, yeah, it was, Apple right. was asking you to spend 400 bucks on an iPad and giving you $1 earbuds. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that was actually part of the, the um, impetus for Jimmy and Dre to start it. I mean, Dre, Dre, who's this great perfectionist, spends all this time tinkering in the studio, and he's like, you know, you're whatever I do, you're still listening to my music on these terrible earbuds and you're not getting the full experience. So there, there was an authenticity to what he was trying to do that I think really resonated with customers. Hey, how close did the social media post of Dre's celebration with Tyrese uh, come to blowing the deal with Apple? Because I have even suggested in the Defiant Ones, the HBO documentary, that it was very tenuous. Uh, yeah, but what what did your research disclose? Oh uh, yeah, the same. I mean, everybody who I talked to said, you know, that was kind of the moment where Tim Cook at Apple was kind of like, oh boy, what have I gotten myself <laughs> into? Uh, and Apple is a, a pretty secretive company yeah. for all their, you know, kumbaya marketing. Um, certainly, from a PR standpoint, they're very, very close lipped, and uh, you know, to to have something like that happen, where I mean, this is the biggest acquisition that Apple had ever made. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and you have this sort of like drunken party. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> shit, yeah. Look who's at the billionaire's club. I think uh, Dre said that was the most embarrassing thing in his life. Like that was. The- I think he said it was one of the three most embarrassing moments yeah. of his life. He didn't say what the other two yeah, were. Maybe but, yeah, maybe the I mean, and Dre, and Dre also has a checkered past. He's, yeah, you know, D. Barnes. Some domestic violence and, yeah. and things yeah. like that. So, you know, he's issued apologies. Um, and he seems to have been forgiven, um, more than, you know, let's say Russell Simmons was yeah. a lot of this stuff well. happened a long time ago and he apologized. He kind of was maybe more open about it. I don't know, but, um, but he, you know, he, he, uh, he's never been accused of, of, you know, sexual assault or, or rape or anything like that. Yeah. Did, did beats really almost go bankrupt before the Apple deal landed? Yeah, it did. And that was one of the revelations in the book. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people don't really fully understand just how perilous things got. Uh, you know, Beats was really teetering on the verge of running out of money uh, right before they got that big cash infusion from Carlyle Group, big private equity group uh, that that they got a little less than a year before the the um, Apple deal. So that really kind of bailed them out and allowed them, you know, to, to keep expanding uh, up to the point where Apple came in. So, you know, I mean, I think to an extent, that's also maybe the case more often than people realize with any private company, with any startup. Um, you know, it's a matter of you're trying to expand as, as fast as possible. Um, and, you know, so you want to be deploying all your money into the business, but um, you know, if you're not careful, you can, you can very easily run out of money and, and they, they almost did there. So, and part of that had to do with the carving out of Noel Lee and monster cable and going about their manufacturing on their own. And you did a masterful job of kind of detailing that. This is a really fascinating part of the book. It really yeah. is. Thanks. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's kind of a poignant story because, you know, Noel Lee is this kind of eccentric character, you know, definitely, um, uh, a good guy. Uh, he, you know, he, he worked at a, a defense uh, lab or when he was growing up and in, early in his career. And, and he was exposed uh, to chemicals that gave him this rare nerve disorder. So he goes around on a Segway because he doesn't <laughs> want to be in a wheelchair. Uh, and, you know, like a Segway with gold flame details. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, a, he's a very sharp guy. And, you know, but um, there was sort of a an almost Shakespearean element to it where like in the deal that, that really monster as a an entity signed with Dre and beats and Jimmy, the, you know, there was this provision, this kind of out clause and, and some people close to the deal say that it was 
Noel's son who signed off on this and that, that Beats was la- able to later exploit this clause that had, had been done sort of, uh, you know, the, this paperwork that had been signed sort of naively um, to, to get out of the deal uh, instead of, you know, continuing that binding relationship. But, you know, Noel actually ended up selling his, uh, I think it was three to 5% that he owned of Beats um, back to uh, Jimmy Dre and the other investors, you know, not, not too long before the Apple deal, because he thought that, that they had no exit strategy. He thought they were going to be screwed without, uh, without a manufacturer like monster on board. So, you know, he lost that on tens of millions of dollars because of that. Well, you also detail how you believe it was a deal for beats head headphones, but just as much for Dre and Ivy to remain on as executive managers and help shepherd in beats music and Apple music, the streaming service. You talk about how this probably doesn't happen under Steve Jobs because he doesn't believe in streaming. Yeah, no, I, I talked to um, Troy Carter, who's who used to manage Lady Gaga and is one of the sort of forward thinking artist managers and business people in the music industry now works at Spotify and is a really prominent venture capitalist who kind of straddling the line between Hollywood and Silicon Valley. And, and he actually had a lot of talks with um, Steve Jobs it, it, before he died. And, and Jobs really felt that um, you know, the people wanted to own their music and streaming was never going to be a thing. So, Oof. you know, he, but, but jobs also believed in that, in the marketing and the panache in, in all of that, that, um, that I think Dre and Jimmy ultimately brought to the table and, you know, was that headphones business worth $3 billion, which is what Apple eventually paid. I mean, I don't think anybody thinks that the headphones business is worth $3 billion, but, uh, you know, and in fact, some, some analysts and private company analysts said as much, and, and that's in the book, but yeah, the, what else was there there, you know, there was bringing these two guys on board, you know, Dre, uh, there's just that that sort of priceless cool factor and Jimmy, you know, in terms of his entertainment connections, somebody who could really, you know, take the, the skeleton that they had built there with beats music and turn it into Apple music. Because don't forget at the time, Apple, you know, they didn't under Steve jobs. They didn't fully embrace streaming. They had, they still had the, you know, iTunes and, and, um, Right. really more focused on downloads and you know this was really what what formed the the framework for apple music which is now you know second uh, to spotify in the u.s in terms of streaming services right well will i am who was also an early investor in beats i think summed it up pretty well and kind of like sums up the theme of the three kings really well when he said it's this deal was not just good for the company it was good for the culture. He said, you have to look at it like kids in the inner city not only dream about being athletes and musicians, but now entrepreneurs and bringers of new, disruptive, cool lifestyle products. A whole new spirit just popped from this one announcement. Yeah. That's right. And, you know, and, and it's it's even bigger than rap or sports. I mean, when do you see, uh, you know, another rapper or an athlete, you know, being involved in a $3 billion deal? I mean, yeah. it's just, it's outrageously huge. So, what a what a cool thing to be able to inspire kids to get into electronics or uh, audio or you know a lot of the other things that beats touches i mean from you know cars to fashion um to computers i mean you know there was a, a beats uh, branded i mean i rented a car in um in la a few months ago and it, it was this dodge or nerd chrysler 300 with the beats branded you know nice. sound system yeah, and everything yeah, yeah. and the subwoofer in the back and uh uh, you know, it, it, so there's there are, there's a lot of different things that, that this touches that that could really I think um, be inspirational to some kids. So Zach, what do you what do you think it is when you look at the overall of the three kings? Um, we've we've seen so many athletes and so many musicians who have tried to open restaurants. They've opened car dealerships and car washes. They've started video games, and most of them go belly up. And some of these guys have lost everything. And then you look at these guys and you read this book and it's like every single thing they touch explodes. Are they smarter than everybody? Are they luckier than everybody? Uh, They missed on some too. Boost Mobile. I I bet they wish they they, had that. And thank you you for bringing that up. That's a key one. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, I think they're they're smarter than everybody and they're luckier than everybody. uh, But they certainly have their share of failures. I think they're just very good at at not broadcasting them, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Jay-Z has a, a ton of failures in, in, in his closet that he just sort of, 
uh, moves on from. I mean, there was going to be a Jay Z Facebook game that they made this whole big thing about, yeah. and that went belly up very quickly um there was gonna be i mean there's a one of my favorite parts of the book is talking about this clothing line that dr dre sort of tried to start with his mom and she really wanted to design this like loungewear line oh, for yeah. oh. couples at home for like middle-aged <laughs> couples at home what was the slogan and again it was called the not slogan too revealing was, or something yeah <laughs> sexy appealing but not too revealing oh it was just so douchey dre let it, that go man, How, <laughs> man that's crazy it, it, yeah that, that didn't that didn't really go anywhere uh, unsurprisingly <laughs> and you know i mean diddy i mean yeah, there were a number of times when it looked like his career was um you know totally over. I mean, even in the beginning, yeah. you know, when he, in the early '90s, he was promoting this um, this show at this charity show uh, at City College in Harlem. There was a stampede, and and uh, you know, several people died. Yeah. And it, you know, he he wasn't found criminally responsible or anything, and and you know, it really did seem it was just sort of like a mob mentality. People understand there wasn't proper, you know, uh, a policing of the of the situation, but you know, it was still. I mean, for a while, it looked like you know it could have destroyed him very early, and this was even before you know Bad Boy and all that stuff took off. And, that story shocked me. I nine people were trampled to death at a charity yeah. basketball game for for AIDS research for AIDS charities. And Puffy, D- Diddy is there trying to like resuscitate people. I mean, that's got to be, I can't even imagine what that does to a person's mind. And yeah, to, to walk from that. And, you know, and, and he knew a lot of the people um, who died, you know. And so I talked to people who were there who were, yeah, who were out there trying to resuscitate people with him on the floor, you know. So it, it was, uh, it, it almost destroyed his career before it started. But it also, you know, it's quite an emotional burden as well. And he's able to overcome that. He's able to, able to overcome the loss of Biggie. Uh, I mean, don't forget when he launched his solo career, uh, you know, pe- the label didn't even want to give him a solo album. I mean, they were like, what? You're a producer. You, you know, you're, <laughs> you're yeah. the most you've ever done is sort of be like a backup dancer in, in videos. So, yeah. but he's, he's one guy to, uh, to never count out, you know? Uh, but yeah, there, there are tons of failures with all these guys. I mean, Jay-Z as a startup investor invested in this uh, private jet sharing startup that crashed and burned no pun intended um yeah so but you know that's what's going to happen if you're an entrepreneur you, you gotta especially if you're an investor you're gonna you're gonna maybe fail nine out of ten times but if that one out of ten is a billionaire, you know is, yeah. is a yeah. airbnb then you know you're a billionaire yeah yeah yep. hey zach you've been so generous with your time i have one more question um you have an art thread that weaves throughout the book. You open with it, you close with it, and there's particular focus on street art and graffiti, black artist involvement in modern art. Explain why that art, and we're talking about like tangible art, painting, sculpture, et cetera, not their music. Why, why is that art important to emphasize when you're talking about these three kings? Yeah, so you know, for, for hip-hop, it goes back to the, the four pillars of hip-hop, which are sort of established by the, the founding fathers, about a cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash. So people think of hip-hop, they think of rap, but it's also, that's just one of the four. Um, there's also graffiti, uh, there's uh, b-boying, and um, so... Uh, and break b b boying, uh, break dancing, and DJing. So it's it's you know there's four elements plus knowledge, which they added later. It's a key part knowledge, uh, but you know graffiti is is one of those pillars. Graffiti, street art, the whole thing. You know it, it um and it, it really pervades the history of hip hop when you think of it coming out of the South Bronx at this time when everything was kind of in ruins and the whole city was like this canvas for everybody to express their sort of you know their frustration with, with, with their living conditions. And that's where you had guys like Fab Five Freddy who did the cover art for the book, um, you know, creating these, these like really colorful landscapes and John Michel Basquiat uh, and, and, you know, with, with his crowns and, um, you know, sort of crowning themselves uh, kings of this new movement that was bubbling up out of New York. And so, you know, the the image of the crown and the journey of somebody like Fab Five Freddy or Jean Michel Basquiat, you know, from from this that kind of bombed out late nineteen seventies New York landscape to the the top of the art world, where you know you see somebody like Jean Michel Basquiat uh, selling his paint. I mean, the the most expensive one went for over a hundred million dollars recently. Ooh. 
he passed away at age 27. So this is all, you know, um, after his death, but over a hundred million dollars for one painting. It's the most expensive piece of artwork sold by any American artist in history. Incredible. Um, yeah. and you know, it's, I think something like in the top 10 of, of, of any artwork, I mean, it goes more for, you know, there are Picassos and Monets that have gone for less. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think it, it kind of, um, it, it mirrors the rise of Jay-Z, Diddy and Dr. Dre from these guys who had nothing to these guys who were billionaires, who were cultural influencers and tastemakers and, you know, not just in music, but across all these things from art to fashion to spirits and, you know, you name it. Um, and education. I think it's, I think one of the coolest aspects of this whole story is, is seeing what Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine are doing, you know, from, from a kid who grew up in the ghetto of Compton, California, to some of the stuff that's going on to rebuild that community and, and the, the buildings they've put in there for music and education. It's really cool to see, you know, two guys able to do something that, government programs are never really going to fully be able to do um uh, yeah that's right yeah i mean and not just that but i mean they're also they launched a uh, a school at usc that they spent tens of millions of yep. dollars funding yep. uh to teach the arts and and you know and especially in the digital age so you know uh, these guys are also giving back with some of the the wealth that they've accumulated well, Zach, as Jay said, thank you so much for the time. It's Zach O'Malley Greenberg. <laughs> Zach O'Malley Greenberg. <laughs> At Zogblog. Yes. Three Kings, Diddy, <laughs> Dr. Dre, Jay-Z, and Hip Hop's multi-billion dollar rise. Uh, it's an absolute... We And we've... We've I know scratched we've talked, the surface. Yeah, there is so much more in, in this book. I know we've, just sounds, we've been talking forever, but there is a ton of cool stuff in here. People are going to love it and really get an, uh, a unique behind-the-scenes look at how all this came to be. Thank you, Zach, so much for the time. We appreciate it and continued success with the book. Thanks, Zach. All right. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Take care. You too.